But we have a system today based on entitlements, and uh, it's, way, it's based on the assumption that uh, some people have a tough time and we have to help them out. And the bleeding hearts say, look, if you don't want to help the people, that means you're heartless, you don't care about people, you're not a humanitarian. But I've come to the conclusion that the humanitarian instincts of almost all people, whether they disagree on solutions, but we have humanitarian instincts that if the humanitarian instinct is drives you to say that we are going to have forced redistribution of wealth, guess what? There's not as much wealth. The humanitarian instinct should drive us to the free market, to property rights, and sound money, and limited government, and less war. Then you will help the maximum number of people, and you will have the largest, wealthiest middle class under those conditions. Sounds like a right, but the use of the word entitlement today isn't. That means some people believe they're entitled to what you make and earn and, 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 and uh, produce. But you don't have a right to somebody else's property, you have, but you should have a right and be entitled to keep what you earn. That's what we need. We have to do. Masses believe they're going to always be taken care of, and you're going to have free education and free houses and free medical care. The, the whole works. And uh, guess what? The entitlement system is built to really help the very wealthy who know how to manipulate the system. And the poor end up with the crumbs, although they were talked into accepting the entitlement system because they thought they were going to get uh, get the help necessary. But today, there is a challenge going on because they talk about the wealthy, and I do, I already have, and criticize those who get bailed out and the very wealthy who benefit from the destruction of money and through the inflationary system. But you don't want to throw out everybody who's wealthy. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy if you earn your money honestly. That's a big deal. Uh, the wealthy get wealthy because they deliver a service to the people. If we make an individual wealthy because they provide a good product and we vote for that product and they become wealthy, but they get no benefits, they get nothing special from the government, no bailouts, no contracts or anything, they should be entitled to keep that. But those who are in the military industrial complex or, the, or in the financial system that benefits from the monetary system that we have, they're not entitled to that. They don't deserve the bailouts and they should be challenged so we have to sort out the two. If we do that, I believe we can return to a much more prosperous economy where we can have growth and jobs once again. is wasteful and it encourages corruption. A lot of people complain about the lobbyists having control, and they do. There's too much control by lobbyists in Washington. But the lobbyist is a consequence. They are the symptom of the problem. Because the lobbying is, is something that is in, encouraged by the fact that the government's running an auction. You know, um, H.L. Mencken said there was an auction off of stolen goods, and that's what the government does. So people have an incentive, the business people, everybody has an incentive to go to Washington because there's this redistribution of wealth and they have this incentive. Now, what we have to do is get the power out of Washington, get the money out of Washington, you won't have the incentive to go up and try to, try to buy this power and, and control. But today, we have a, a system that has been totally undermined, and the special interests do have control of it. But another way we can solve this, if we, once again, had only those people who were dedicated to the Constitution, who weren't influenced by these special interests, and couldn't be bought off, this would all come to an end as well. Did the lobbyists get to you and lobby you? And I said, well, on occasion they did, but uh, they, they found out they didn't do any good, you know. <laughs> is something that has to be addressed, but the other thing that I talk about a whole lot, and the place where I want to do the first cutting, 
because I do want to start, uh, you know, with a token cut in the first year of uh, one trillion dollars. Yeah. government in the last 40, 50, 60 years has conditioned so many to be so dependent on government, and some are tragically dependent on government. When you think of the elderly dependent on medical care and the children dependent on medical care, I don't believe that is the place where you start to cut. You don't start to cut on a food stamp program because the conditions have been created by bad government. So I want to work our way out of it. I want to have priorities. So where my priorities are to cut the big bucks are the, money, are the dollars that we spend so foolishly overseas. just for the spending overseas. Just think if we would have had those strict constitutionalists that I long for in Washington, where there would have, oh, we would only go to war with a declaration of war and no other way. That's right. Of the, of the founders of the country and the revolutionaries against the British. So the king would go to war and then they would get taxed to uh, pay, pay for the wars. So we, we need to go to war only if there's a declaration. If there's a need to it and to defend this country, uh, we should declare the war as we did in World War II. Go fight and win it and just come home. That's what we need. fighting two huge nations, Germany and Japan, less than four years they were defeated. And uh, yet here we are, we're in, we're in Afghanistan, and believe it, uh, we're not out of Iraq yet, I'll tell you. We're in a mess in there looking to go into Syria and Iran, it's just constant. But we've been doing this for 10 years. It, uh, it, it makes no sense whatsoever, but if we had only gone with a declaration of war, we wouldn't have gone into these wars since, uh, you know, it's Korea, Vietnam, and everything since have been gone basically by the executive branch. So, if you decide that I'm going to be in the executive branch, I will not go to war without a proper directive from the people and the U.S. Syria and go to Iran. It's, just, it's very, very similar to what was happening on, on the preparation to go into Iraq. The uh, Iraqi uh, war uh, was planned many years before. The first talk uh, in the House floor I ever gave was in 1998, believing that there was war coming and I was trying to head it off. But that didn't happen until after 9-11. 9-11, a terrible day in our history. But I think it's been misunderstood. I do not believe that we were attacked, nor will we be attacked, because we're free and prosperous. I do not believe that is the reason. Right. Right. But when there is a crisis, whether it's an economic crisis that uh, requires us to bail out those in privileged positions, 
or when we have an international crisis like 9-11. It's used as an excuse to do the very things they've been wanting to do all along. Right. Yeah. Of course, it turned out there were no weapons of mass destruction. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Guess what? There's, there's Al-Qaeda in Iraq today. And uh, this, this whole idea that, well, we have to go wherever they are. The terrorists are everywhere. And there are Taliban everywhere. We have to kill every Taliban. But you know, the Taliban are not the Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda are radical enough, and, and they're incensed enough that they want to come here, and they do want to kill us because of the problems that we've had with our foreign policy. But Taliban are people who want to just foreigners off their land, whether they're the Soviets or whether it's the United States or the French or the British. They just want to be left alone. And uh, if we're going to try to... That is, if they are defending their homeland and we're trying to kill them and they're going to kill us because we're there, the more we go in, the more Taliban there's going to be. The more the people, that, it's a catch-22. There's no ending to it. That is why right. the non-interventionist foreign policy of the founders makes so much sense. Let them deal with their problems. We'll deal with our problems here in Hollywood. say, well, they write us off quickly and say, oh, you're a bunch of isolationists. You don't want to deal with the world. But you know what? It's exactly the opposite. Guess who the isolationists are? The, isolation, the isolationists are the ones who want to put sanctions on all these countries to punish them. And what do they do? They really punish them and then have an overthrow of government? They you know, solidify the power and bring out their own nationalism. So when we try to punish the Iranians, we solidify the power of Ahmadinejad. It does the opposite. I don't know whether they do it on purpose or they just don't know what they're doing, but it isn't good. It doesn't work. And, uh, but San sanctions are sanctions is a part of the isolationism that uh, they accuse us of, and uh, because the founders and what I believe is that we should be friends with as many people as we can, trade with people, and travel. With people. The people, President Ron Paul. We removed the sanctions from Cuba. Why can't we travel to Cuba? We've had sanctions on Cuba for 50 years, and the Castro's are still there. It didn't work very well. But I'll tell you what, the, in the theory behind what the founders thought and, and what free markets describe is that when you're free, uh, having free trade and markets, there's a self-interest involved to stay that way and not fight each other. You know, we were we were fighting the communists, we were fighting the Chinese, we were fighting the uh, Vietnamese communists, and of course that war went very poorly. Uh, we lost that war. We we came home. A million Vietnamese died, and sixty thousand Americans died. But we had to come home. And they, they warned us, they said there would be this horrible, horrible thing. There would be a domino effect and the communists would take over the whole world. Well, guess what? It must be free markets that moved in that direction, left our country, because now our banker is in China. So uh, it yeah. hasn't worked all that well. But just think now, we do trade and talk to China under imperfect situations. But just think, we're not killing each other. When I was in high school, you know, we were killing each other. A teacher of mine went off to school off to Korea and didn't come back. It made no sense to me. But what about what, what about Vietnam? Now we trade with them, we invest over there, they come over here, imperfect, we're imperfect, they're imperfect. But just think how much more was achieved in peace, which was never achieved in all that fighting for The um, atmosphere that surrounds war, and various kinds of wars, whether it's the wars overseas, or the atmosphere dealing with civil liberties here at home when you have another war that goes on against the American people that causes so much trouble and so much undermining our civil liberties, that is that onerous war on drugs that has caused so much trouble.
Now the war, the war, uh, the war on drugs has been going on. The modern day war on drugs uh, has occurred since the early 1970s. There was a more minimal war prior to that, but prior to 1912, there was no war on drugs, and uh, a lot of people survived. You know, even in those years, uh, they were able to go out and buy whatever they wanted. But the, the war on drugs is, is very, very dangerous. Uh, but the war on drugs is, uh, as a matter of fact, drugs are very, very dangerous. But the war on drugs, I think, is more dangerous than the drugs themselves. I do want to make a very strong point, both as a physician, as a parent, and as a grandparent, all drugs are dangerous. Illegal drugs are dangerous. The war on drugs are dangerous. But prescription drugs are very dangerous as well. And certainly if we would follow the rules about uh, giving more prerogatives to the states, uh, some states now are just making token efforts to say that people who smoke marijuana for medical reasons should be allowed to. A few states have passed laws. That Every hand of the federal government come down, they undo this whole principle of states' rights and say that we will tell you what you do. And our federal government has been known to arrest sick people in wheelchairs, uh, individuals who are getting benefits from marijuana, and putting them in prison. That makes no sense. Boo. Boo. But the, the real harm done by the war on drugs. Uh, we, we can't dismiss the fact that drugs are very dangerous. But the real danger is the undermining of our personal civil liberties because that is used as an excuse to invade our home without search warrant. It's gotten much worse with this uh, other law that was passed after 9-11, and that, that is called the Patriot Act, which should be removed. The Patriot Act, as I have said in the debates, is very unpatriotic. The, uh, the Patriot Act was passed, and that, that bill was floating around for a long time, and there was an opportunity to pass it and uh, get a bill out there that they wanted to pass all along. But you know, if they would have called that bill repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, maybe it wouldn't have passed. Yeah. Yeah. see the name on a bill being going through the uh, Congress, the name is almost always opposite of what it's going to end up doing. You know? so it, it was a, it's a very bad piece of legislation. So I think next year, when we get this opportunity to change some of these yeah. things, we should Woo! call it... Uh, We shouldn't call it uh, repeal the Patriot Act. Uh, what we should do is uh, let's, uh, let's restore the Fourth Amendment yeah. Act. Yeah. is covered too many times. The SWAT teams had been coming into our homes and into our apartments, breaking in without proper source warrants. Now they can do it wholesale. They, and, and lo and behold, I imagine you have heard there's a few occasions when they actually go into the wrong homes. And they've actually killed the wrong people. They shouldn't even be doing it. But it is out of control. They'll march in our homes without the proper authority. And the Fourth Amendment was supposed to guarantee that we would not be invaded by our government without a proper search warrant. Yeah. And it's also the Patriot Act that has encouraged those individuals that are supposed to be protecting us our airports, but what did they do? They prod and poke and x-ray us without any proper permission either. So someday we can think up a better way to protect us at the airports without the TSA. Yeah. About a year ago, the uh, president sent
sent somebody over to the Senate and he announced a new policy. And the new policy was that the president, he, under his understanding as being the commander in chief, he could assassinate American citizens. No! He explained it constitutionally. He said that uh, he's the commander in chief, and if, there's, if it's not prohibited in the Constitution, he's allowed to do anything he wants. Uh, yeah. I think he has it flipped around a little bit. He's supposed to be able to do only the things that he has the explicit authority to do. Prove his point. He's already now assassinated three Americans. Well, the first one, Alaki, probably a bad guy. Even though they didn't have, they never made any charges. They never had a trial. They never said he did anything. But he probably was associated with some bad actors. He wasn't in this country, so they said we're going to go after him. And with a drone missile, they killed him. So he had no due process. But they said that another family member was an associated force, you know, associated with him, so therefore he was guilty too. So the next week they assassinated him. But it turned out he was 16 years old, barbecuing in the backyard with his cousin. I don't think that's what America is supposed to be all about at all. Oh, I, I think we have to have oh, wow. respect for civil liberties in this country. The president has taken too much power. The Congress encourages the president. They've done it, you know, with the war on drugs. And uh, also, also, just this, in December, they passed a bill, the National Defense Authorization Act. <laughs> and it's obvious that you know a little bit about them. But we should that's right. <laughs> All over. Because I know you didn't hear about it on the evening news. That's what I'm sure. Yeah. Bill, uh, the Congress gave the President the authority to arrest any American uh, citizen who is an associated force, maybe website, attending a meeting, having emails or whatever, just be as loosely associated with somebody, you can be charged, but arrested by the military, which, which violates Posse Comitatus, that's eventually been, uh, essentially been repealed, and you can be arrested, denied an attorney, denied charges, denied a trial, and put in a secret prison indefinitely. And that's what the law says. Boo! If we want to live in a republic, we can't allow this stuff to stay on the books. We gotta, we gotta stand up and say, enough is enough. We need to change this and quit I'm doing this to it. and our civil liberties. But the great thing is that there are certain groups coming together right now who are really standing up for these values. One is a group of people who have known about these views for a long time, have felt frustrated, they've sort of dropped out, discussed it with both parties, and maybe never voted again, but now they're coming in and they're getting excited about a different view on government. But also, there's a young group of people now graduating into the uh, adulthood who now, in the college age group, are enthusiastic about these views. That's what gets me excited. fantastic in the 50s and the 60s when I was looking for information and trying to sort these things out. It wasn't all that easy. I mean, I certainly couldn't get it off the TV. I certainly couldn't get it from my government. I couldn't get it from my government schools. But there were certain, just a few people who were holding together and expressing these views. But today, we don't have that handicap. Today, we have a very, very public secret weapon that is the internet. Now, you 
because uh, you know it's a powerful weapon, and they've already been working very hard on clamping down on the internet. And this stop online piracy act was a very, very bad bill. Let's be grateful that's been taken off the dock. the people wake up and send the message, even those individuals in Washington who are sound asleep get the message because they were getting onto that bill wholesale. They had the votes. It was about to come to the floor. The people like you woke up and sent messages out there. So we still have enough freedom to wake this country up and change the direction, but it has to come from the people. It won't come top down. It has to come from the people because government reflects the values of the people. So if that's what you want and you speak out and you do your job, Washington will change. I, my personal convictions uh, are that um, the, the goals ought to be very, very plain. Living in a free society is what I want. I've always been convinced that even if I lived in a free society and didn't have as much wealth, I still want to live in a free society. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, fortunately for us, we don't have to make that decision. The freer society, the richer the society. The bigger the middle class and the more wealth there is, the better the distribution. So we never have to be bashful when the, the so-called humanitarians say, well, you who believe in the free market and, and, and capitalism, you don't care about people. You care about people, you will defend liberty, you will defend the free markets and sound money and no special interest out of the U.S. government to do special